I'm Lisa Chapman, class of 81, the chair of First Gen Yale. And before we start our formal program, I'd like to say a few words in respect for, for recent events. First Gen Yale and alumni advocate for racial justice and, and equity for all. I'd like to ask for a moment of silence for the family of George Floyd, for all those suffering from racial injustice, and for our country at large. Thank you. Following this event, we are working on our third uh, webinar focused on the working title, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the Screenwriting Profession. So stay tuned for that uh, coming in a few weeks. Today, we're honored to host two Yaleys. May I invite Timothy Cooper and Derek Webster to um, sign in your video? Hello. There you are, Good Timothy. Day. Hi, can you wave? There's Timothy. Hey, I'm Timothy. And Derek? This is Derek. Good to see y'all. And that's great. Timothy Cooper uh, is class of 02 Berkeley College. He is the award-winning writer, director, and an improv or improv improvisio based in Brooklyn. And first, Jan Yaley, Derek Webster, class of 99, is Pearson College. He's the Associate Director for the Arts at the Office at the Yale Office of Career Strategy. Today, you're going to be presented with the opportunity to Screenwriting 101, write your first screenplay. Timothy wrote and directed the Writers Guild Award-nominated Concierge, the series starring Kate McKinnon, and the Tribeca uh, short film Lemon. He has numerous other works for in his biography included in your invitation for today. Through his company, Blue Screen Screenwriter, Screenwriting Group, Timothy has taught hundreds of writers, helping them to sell their scripts to major studios, to staffs on multiple networks and cable TV shows, and so much more. In addition, he has helped artists screen and win not just not just present but also win at the south by southwest sundance tribeca con and many more film festivals today timothy will take take us in a deeper dive into the mechanics of developing your concept structuring your script outlining your story and creating character characters dialogue and action including twists and turns which will hook your reader and build a vision the world has never seen before. Whether you're aiming for an indie, a blockbuster, a TV series, a short, a digital series or more, you're gonna wanna hear this essential introduction to the fundamental tools of screenwriting. Derek Webster will share his experience as a literary manager and strip consultant in Los Angeles for over 10 years. Derek works at OCS as, as the, um, uh, Associate Director for the Arts, where he organizes and expands the university's arts career resources as part of common good and creative careers. He has been at OCS for the last five years and at Yale for the last 10 years. Uh, First Gen Yale is thrilled to support OCS and to host Timothy and Derek today and to do anything we can to help current students, Yale College students, uh, alumni, graduates, Graduate School of the Arts and Sciences and postdocs. So let me turn it over now to Timothy for your wonderful program. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. I'm so excited uh, to give the second in the series. Um, before I begin, I'd also like to say a few words about the events of the past few weeks, um, which are, you know, both tragic and hopeful at the same time. So personally, I hope they bring much needed change to the country and specifically to the film and television industry. Ideally, they'll help spur me and many others to take action to promote more diversity, listening and equality in this business and thus in the world at large. I still certainly have much to learn, but as I do, I hope to further enable and amplify diverse voices through this workshop and my other actions. To that end, we're already planning, as Lisa mentioned, a third in this webinar series, which will be a panel 
focused on diversity within this industry. So we look forward to bringing you that soon. And now I'm so excited to share this program with you. Um, as you might expect, you know, this will be an overview of some of the tools that you need to start writing your first script. So let's get started. First, I'll present a few examples of some great scripts, great first pages. And then we'll talk about log lines, where, which are an essential component to writing your script, to understanding your own idea and taking your concept as far as it can go just in the conception. Then we'll talk a little bit about the craft of writing itself. And then I'll present a few resources that can help you uh, on your screenwriting journey. And then we'll have some concluding remarks before we get to the uh, Derek's uh, comments and then some Q&A. So please prepare your questions and you can even send them to us anytime you like in the chat window and we'll get to them after Derek's remarks. So why does the craft of screenwriting matter so much? Well, to start, most scripts aren't very good. Um, that sounds like a broad generalization, but broadly speaking, it's pretty true. The more you work in the industry, you, the more you realize that because so many people have seen mediocre movies, they think, well, I could write a mediocre script, so why can't I get in the industry? So the industry is deluged with pretty mediocre to bad scripts. So my goal with everything I do is to help you make something that breaks through that wall and gets to the gatekeepers, the people who hold the purse strings, who hold the power, the executives, directors, stars, and so on, who can actually get your movie to the screen. Um, that said, I highly recommend that you start by writing a short and you work your way toward a feature and toward a pilot from there, but shorts and web series in particular are great ways to start because you can make them yourself. You don't need anyone to tell you, yes, you can do this, here's a budget. You can just go and make it yourself. But even then, it's still competitive in the short film industry, in the festival circuit, you still want to have, you still have to have a fantastic script. So it's a hyper competitive industry and it's a risk averse industry. So it's very hard to make people take a bet. Why? Because acquiring or making something requires an investment or payout of hundreds of thousands at the very least and hundreds of millions uh, at the higher end and thousands of, of employees and person hours. So that is why it's pretty risk averse. It's like starting a company. Uh, people are very reluctant to invest in that company, especially if it's some unknown quantities. You want some people on the board who have been at those uh, bigger companies before. So that's why it's hard as a beginning screenwriter to break in, but it is possible. You have to have a voice, you have to have something to say, and you have to say it really well. And of course, it's hard to get people's attention, um, especially at the box office, on Netflix, cable, on the web, anywhere. It's hard to get their attention. There are so many outlets now. I mean, look at YouTube, anyone and his or her brother can make something. So how do you break through that? How do you get something that really demands an investment? So to start, every element has to engage the reader. There can't be any component that isn't working, that is lazy, uh, that is not at least somewhat original, that isn't uh, screaming with your voice, your emotion, uh, the theme that you want people to take away. So some of those components include formatting, um, strong genre, understanding what the genre is, uh, having a hook, that means what grabs your audience in the first place, uh, having a lead who has a journey, who goes on a journey. We don't want something where we go through the entire script and then at the end we're like, oh, that person just kind of meandered along through life Passively, I'm not sure why I sat through that TV series, short film, feature film, et cetera. Uh, if I'm going to see a drama, I want it to be dramatic. If I'm gonna see something suspenseful or mystery, I want it to be suspenseful. If I'm gonna see a comedy, I want it to be funny. These seem like obvious 
um, lessons, and yet sometimes it's easy to forget. You you watch something and you're like, that wasn't particularly funny, or you read something and you know it was meant to be dramatic, but you didn't feel anything. So those are some of the cylinders that need to be firing for your script to break through. You want the subject matter to be relevant and timely. You want a message or theme that you strongly believe in and that you can get others on board for. You need to have some powerful classic structure. We don't wanna go completely outside the bounds of accepted structures for TV shows and feature films. And you want your personality itself when people are talking to you and your professionalism of your script to shine. Um, and you'd be surprised at how many people are great writers, and yet when they get into the meeting room to pitch their TV show or their feature film, or just talk to people at the party at the film festival, you can tell they're not very professional, their personality is someone you wouldn't wanna work with. So all of these components have to be working. And what that means is that your script is not cliched. It's not boring. It's not preachy, long-winded, it's not dull, confusing, probably the number one issue that I encounter as someone who reads hundreds, if not thousands of scripts a year, I'm confused. I don't know who I'm supposed to care about. I don't know exactly what's going on. I don't know exactly what the journey is. Um, there are also scripts that are perfectly competent, but they you can tell they didn't really have a strong theme. They didn't really have a voice. They didn't really have anything new to say. Other times there's no clear theme. So I don't know what I was supposed to take away really. It was just say violence for violence's sake and I don't really know what to make of that. There could be something to say about that but I'm not sure because the character had no real perspective. And other times I read a whole script and it's just not worth the journey. Um, so we've, think about you're, you're asking people to invest time in you before they invest money in you. And the people you're asking to spend time on you are the readers the gatekeepers, those who are professionally uh, employed to read scripts for studios or for a famous actor, their production company, uh, for a network, et cetera. And their job is to read scripts and make sure they don't waste their boss's time, but they only pass upward what was worth their time and will be worth their superior's time. So if you read a whole script and it just wasn't really worth the hour and a half, the two hours, the three hours you devoted to reading those hundred something pages, then they're not gonna pass it up the chain. So there's some practical considerations I want you to be thinking about as we're going through today's class. So here are some components that a screenplay requires. First of all, as I mentioned, a hook, a theme, which is something to say. You need a lead with an active, tangible goal. And there need to be one or more obstacles preventing her from reaching that goal. If these uh, areas seem obvious, I can guarantee you that they must not be because as someone who has read for many different producers and production companies um, and directors, it is simply not true that uh, characters often have a tangible goal. Sometimes people will say, oh, there wasn't really any goal. It was just someone's exploration of himself or it's a coming of age, but nothing really happens. And to that I say, what, why do you expect that to break through this wall? Um, why would that require an investment? It has to be, I'm not saying you need uh, fireworks and car crashes, far from it. But if we're going for drama, we want drama. We want to be moved. We want to feel something. We want to remember something. We want to be talking about it. Um, we want to be telling our friends about it. And you, to do that, you'll need obstacles to prevent your character from reaching that goal. They can't, they, the obstacle can't really be just themselves. And it can't be really society. Um, it can't be just a general feeling. In general, we want to embody those obstacles in one person, and sometimes more than one person. And that's my next bullet point, right? We want an antagonist or clear opposition that usually embodies those obstacles in some way. That is what we go to the movies, that's what we go to TV, that's what we go to short films, uh, podcasts, web series for. If there's no opposition, then someone will just breeze through and we won't really have felt anything, we, it won't have been worth the journey. We also need a limited time frame. It can't just take place over the course of someone's entire life. 
There are a few films that can get away with that, but those are typically from master filmmakers who already have major stars on board. So if you already are that person, great. Um, that's awesome that you're here. Thank you for being here. But otherwise, you need a limited time frame, and the shorter, the better, right? So if it's a short film and it can be in mostly real time, that's fantastic. Um, if you have a feature film and it takes place over the course of a day, or a week, that's great. If it takes place over 25 years, not as exciting. It's just not as interesting to us as a compact time frame in which we have an active, tangible goal. Uh, we want it to read quickly. We want it to be properly formatted. We definitely want an ironic situation. That means a character who is least suited for this task is your lead. Uh, I'll get into that a little more later, but we rarely, if ever, want some character who is perfectly suited for the task at hand. If that is the case, they won't really face many major obstacles to reaching their goal, and therefore it won't be much of a journey. Um, the script will be over in a few pages and it won't have been worth our time. So if you think about your favorite films, they all, almost all of them involve some level of serious irony, even within the basic premise, which is a log line, which we'll get to shortly. Um, we want to go on an epic journey. Uh, we need high stakes, so things that matter to the character. It doesn't need to be about saving the world, but they need to matter deeply to this character. We want the character to go through an arc, that is, they learn something about themselves. They go on that journey emotionally, physically, romantically, etc. We need an emotional payoff by the end. And we want this to be the worst day of the character's life. If, in general, if you pick the second worst day of the character's life, that's not the most interesting day. The most interesting day is the worst day of your character's life. Think about the stories you tell. Do you, still, do you tell people stories when they say, you know, what's going on? And you're like, oh, I have a story for you. Do you talk about just a regular day when it was slightly difficult to do the laundry that day? No, you don't. You talk about the craziest thing that happened to you recently, the most obstacles you encountered, the most wacko person you encountered. Um, so we don't want to hear about the second most interesting day, the second worst day of the character's life. We want to hear about the worst day of your character's life. And in general, that's actually where we want to start your film or TV show. And then, of course, things can get even worse from there and should. So let's go through a few examples of first pages of some great scripts, some award-winning scripts. Some, uh, most, uh, several of them are Oscar-winning or Emmy-winning scripts, in fact, and series. So this is the first page of Jojo Rabbit by Taika Waititi. And starts out using, first of all, formatting is all there. It's professionally formatted, great. And what do we see but quick shots, someone dressing themselves, but they're applying eye pencil to their top lip. That's odd. And who is the first person we meet? It is our hero. It is a cute 10 year old boy who has drawn a Hitler mustache on his upper lip. So already we have a somewhat ironic situation or an unexpected situation. Why is this boy doing this? That's a, that's totally bizarre. We rarely, if ever, seen that on the screen, especially the first image we're presented with. We're intrigued. I'm going to keep reading. There's no chance that I will stop reading at this point. I'm already dying to know why this is the situation. Um, then he speaks. And then um, a modern, a contemporary song by Nick Cave starts. So that's interesting. Over something that is incongruous, it's a boy dressed in, this boy dressed in a Hitler youth uniform. And he does a Nazi salute by the end of the first page. There's no way I won't keep reading and audiences won't keep watching. It really speaks strongly, has a powerful voice, um, controversial, fascinating, engaging, infuriating, whatever you call it, you're gonna keep reading it. And it probably has something really strong to say. And it does. This is the first page of the pilot of Fleabag. So we start with this, woman, she's out of breath, she's inside, she turns to the camera. She's earnest and is in pain. And 
she clearly has set herself up to look like she just uh, got up or she's a little bit discombobulated. And she says, you accidentally make it out like you have to get out of bed, drink half a bottle of wine, get in the shower, shave everything, put on some agent provocateur business, suspend her belt and wait by the door until the buzzer goes. So she's clearly been waiting here, uh, posed like this for a while. And then she casually says, oh, hi, to the handsome man who's called guy you like, which is interesting in and of itself. And they, and then she's talking to the camera more, then you get to it immediately and they start snogging. So already totally on board, ironic. She's, she's self-destructive, self-knowing. She understands herself to some extent, but also probably doesn't. I'm totally on board with this character. This is the first page of Get Out. Um, really interesting, not least because it starts with a Bible verse, which is interesting. Oh, okay, is this gonna be a religious? But then it starts with this modern day family. Okay, so it's not set in, you know, biblical times. And they're talking about, Dis this is this uh, white family talking about Disney World. And then in contrast, um, Andre, 29, African-American man, runs down the sidewalk and sweats, listening to jazz. And he stops in front of this house. And then the owner of the house looks outside and he watches this black man protectively. So we know this is going to be strongly about race. It's already built a sense, sense of dread and probably horror. And uh, there's some you know, hints at comedic elements too, which ends up being what this film is. It's a horrifying mix of comedy and uh, terror. So again, a lot of ironic elements, thematic elements, and I'm already on board. There's no way I'm gonna stop reading in the middle of this already suspenseful scene. So hopefully you guys are seeing exactly what I'm talking about, which is that there's no beating around the bush in terms of what genre we're in and what type of journey we're probably gonna go on. And this is just the first page of you know, around 100 pages. And uh, finally, this is the first page of the great series Search Party by Sarah Violet Bliss and Charles Rogers. And what is this? It's a half hour comedy with suspense elements. And what does it start with? It starts with a suspense element. There are volunteers traipsing through the woods, yelling out someone's name, Chantal. And then we have Dory. And look at just her first description. We can tell she's our main character because she's introduced first. She's the first person who's named. And she's fragile, frustrated, and a lifelong doormat and angry New Yorkers are piling up behind her at the subway turnstile. So already I'm on board, I'm rooting for this underdog type of character. I feel bad for her. I'm dying to know how that ties in to this missing woman. Couldn't be more on board. So hopefully you see some of these great examples and also want to read more and see how these are people at the top of their craft. This is not the first script they've written. I doubt it's even the 20th script they've written. They've written many, many scripts to get to this level of writing, intrigue, comedy, suspense, horror, you name it. Let's talk about log lines next. So what is a log line? Why do you need to know this? Well, a log line is a preferably one, maybe two, but I prefer one sentence summary of your script that captures the fundamental elements. That is the protagonist, the conflict, and hopefully a little bit of the tone. So we can tell it's gonna be a sci-fi, if it's gonna be sci-fi. We can tell it's historical, if it's gonna be historical, etc. What is the purpose of this? Because very few people will see this. Maybe if you get to send this, if you get lucky enough to send this to an agent, manager, director, producer, or the like, maybe you'd get to send this along, or maybe your agent or other representative would send this along. But more important, it's for you to truly understand the fundamental elements of your script. A lot of people instantly think, and I instantly thought, well, there's no way I can capture an entire 30 page comedy uh, series, an entire hour long 60 page drama series, an entire 100 something page feature film in just a log line. It's much more nuanced than that. Even a short film or web series is more nuanced than a single sentence. Well, of course it is. No one is questioning that. But you need to know your core components in order to make 
a strong lead, who has a strong goal, and they're facing an immense ironic obstacle. And if you don't know those components, arguably you don't really have a firm grasp on your idea yet. Now, of course, you can go back and forth. You could write some of your script, then go back to the logline and hone it. Go back to the script, go back to the logline and hone it. I do that all the time. But the more you can understand your logline and think about it and work on it and refine it each day, the more you'll have a strong seed from which a strong sapling and then a strong oak tree can grow. So here's my logline template that I use with all of my clients and students, and it serves them and me quite well. And it is when protagonist encounters the major conflict and or worst day of her life event, there's that worst day of their life, she must take this action-oriented goal that has some sort of obstacle in front of it, or else they'll face a major time-sensitive consequence. I know this might seem complex now, but it actually ends up being really simple, and I'll show you a few uh, examples. Now, that's not to say that it will be simple to encapsulate your entire script in this log line, but I advocate going from the opposite direction. Start with this. See if you can put in a protagonist. See if you can put in and an know already the worst day of her life event. See if you can figure out the action-oriented goal that has a major obstacle and a major consequence. And if you can figure those components out, you can always refer back to them during the writing process. So once you've written your logline or as you're writing your logline, you will have these essential elements, hopefully, by the end of the process. So first, who is your protagonist? You can, this will help you figure out what is their goal, what is the biggest obstacle to them achieving that goal, and what are the consequences if they don't achieve that goal? Again, does this all seem sort of basic or fundamental? Yes. And uh, as a professional reader, I will say that I encountered um, possibly 98 to 99 out of 100 scripts. I read the whole script, or I read the first, you know, 20, 50 pages, and I still didn't know the answers to these. And I can bet that the author didn't really know these either. So you have to know these essential components. I say before you write, but let's just call it as you write, because you can always come back and refine the log line, as I mentioned. But the more you can know this or work on it as you're going through the writing process, the stronger your eventual project will be. So here are some log lines that are simple and doable, uh, and from films that we know. Uh, liar, liar, when his son wishes he will only tell the truth, an attorney who's a pathological liar is magically compelled be honest for one day and struggles to win the biggest case of his career without telling a lie. So you can see this has all those components in it. Um, it has the main character, an attorney who's a pathological liar. Great, there's already irony within that. That's already a character who's in a way very well suited to his job, in a way the worst suited to the job of being a parent at least and potentially of being an at least ethical human being and attorney. And why is it extra ironic? Well, the tangible goal is the biggest case of his career. And this is the day that he cannot tell a lie. The essential crutch that he has leaned on his entire life. So that is uh, what we call a high concept log line. And if you can execute this with even a modicum of, of uh, competence and confidence, uh, it will sell. Let's talk about Minority Report. In a future where criminals are arrested before the crime occurs, a drug addicted cop struggles on the lam to prove his innocence in a murder he has not yet committed. There's irony working at multiple levels from a drug addicted cop, someone who's allegedly supposed to follow the law, and someone who believed in the system where you can tell a crime before it occurs, but he believes he's innocent in a murder he has not yet committed. So again, this is pretty high concept, not saying you're uh, Logline has to be anything like this, but you can tell it has all those essential components. And if you're working from this, you have a really strong foundation. Here's a little bit of a punch up uh, for Happy Gilmore. Uh, before a hockey player takes up golf and becomes a superstar, it changes sport. 
okay, it has some of the elements we're looking for, but there's no real time frame, there's no real goal, there's no real obstacle there. And how would you ideally write this as you were refining it over time? Well, a hockey player with severe anger issues is forced to join the golf tour, a sport he detests in order to save his grandmother's home. So it has a specific protagonist with an ironic problem. In a way, he has severe anger issues, which are sort of antithetical to golf, arguably, or the milieu of golf. And it's a sport he detests, but he has a specific tangible goal, which is to save his grandmother's home. So we know the consequences if he fails. So that has all the components of a great logline. And here's another not so great version of a logline that I made up. It's called Sworn to Protect. This movie does not exist yet. Feel free to steal it because it's not very good. Why? A Secret Service agent must risk everything to save the US president he's sworn to protect. Why is this not very interesting? Well, first of all, there's no real time frame on it. It's not clear why it's the worst day of this character's life. For one thing, the Secret Service agent has to save the president every day, arguably. I mean, maybe there's some event, but it's not clear what the specific event being mentioned here is. But worse, there's no real irony to it. A Secret Service agent's job is to protect the president or other high level political figures. So they're probably trained pretty well to do that. They're not the worst character for this particular situation. But that's what we're looking for, is the worst character for this particular situation. So how could we do that? Well, we could go on either end, but let's just start with a Secret Service agent. Let's have it not be a Secret Service agent. Let's have it be someone who is, uh, let's just say, out of shape, or, um, you know, let's just say, you know, sedentary, um, or they have limited mobility, um, they are anti-gun, let's say, uh, maybe they're anti the president, so they don't even want to save the president, so we have to find a way that they were put in this situation where they had to save the president. Um, maybe it's not, uh, maybe it's not even the president, maybe it's something a lot lower level, like uh, the uh, owner of the local uh, fast food place, and then that could be sort of a comedic situation. And why are people attacking the owner of the local fast food place? Don't know. Um, but we want someone who is least suited no matter what. Um, maybe they're someone who's, um, a, maybe it's their own relative who has made an attack on the president. So they have to, they feel responsible, their own um, parent or child, right? So we're trying to build multiple levels of irony, um, elements we haven't seen before, drama and suspense. So you see there are many ways to go about this, but again, you would be shocked at how many times I see something exactly like the non-existent sworn to protect. And already the, the more you read, the less you're interested, right? Because there's no irony, there's no specifics to it. So let's talk a little bit about the craft of screenwriting itself. Um, I wish I had more time to go into outlining, um, but hopefully in a future class, um, but the log line, I thought, was vital to really understanding how to create that base that everything else builds off of. So, let's talk about the craft of the screenplay itself. First of all, screenplays are not novels, short stories, articles, etc. Um, they have narrative elements, but they're their own art form. And the more you read, the better you'll get at writing them, the more familiar you'll be with the very specific structure and format. And I can instantly tell when I'm reading a script that, oh, this, this person hasn't really invested in learning about this business. They haven't read many scripts. Um, they're not familiar with what's out there. They don't really understand formatting, irony, log lines, characters, obstacles, goals, et cetera. I could tell. Uh, and I bet Derek would confirm this, within pages or less. So here are some things I want you to keep in mind as you're learning about the craft of screenwriting. And I want you to save this for the next slide when I've written a very bad screenplay page that I want you to check out. So um, 
first of all, they're highly efficient. It's one of the most efficient art forms. It's almost like a haiku at times. You don't have as many pages as you want. You have a very set number of pages. In particular, for a short, I would recommend five to 15 pages. For a half hour, in general, we want 30 to 35. An hour long drama is usually under 65. And a feature is generally 100 to 112, somewhere in that range. You could, there are a few exceptions to the rule, but it's very, very rare. Um, this shows that you understand the format, you understand the page count requirements, and you don't think that you're above it by having, oh, I have so much to say, I can go 190 pages. Aaron Sorkin can do that. Uh, the rest of us mortals cannot. Um, so it's highly efficient. There's a set structure to it. If you're doing a sitcom, in general, there are acts. If you're doing an hour long, in general, there are four acts where there were four or five acts where there were three acts in a half hour. Um, so there's a very set structure and there's a specific outline template that you'll want to use. And there are many theories about this, but they all boil down to the same thing in a feature as well. Um, and that's for a future class. But it's less, uh, meandering, it's more cause and effect. So a novel, you can go back and forth, you can meander, you can go into someone's thoughts, etc. A screenplay, we demand cause and effect. We don't want anything, there's nothing that we see or hear that is insignificant. There's no line that is extraneous. People don't talk exactly like they do in real life where people say, um, or uh, they double back on themselves, they restart their sentences, etc. No, every single word matters and has to be highly efficient and information packed in a screenplay. Use brief punchy sentences so that our eye just runs down the page, just zips through the screenplay. You use lots of short paragraphs. We rarely want anything long. Um, anything more than even three or four lines kind of starts to read like a little bit of a novel to professional screen, uh, screenplay readers. Um, so you have to be very short, very punchy, very efficient. We want to use the essential components of screenwriting that you saw in those examples, which are slug lines, action, dialogue, parentheticals. That's pretty much it. Um, there are a few other small elements, but really it boils down to just using those elements that are standardized and you have to even use just one font. There's only one font that is used in screenplays, but know that everyone is working with the same playing field. So that is why you have to excel within these parameters. You have to use present tense. You have to be active. These characters have to be active. They can't be passive. They can't be boring. They can't just let life happen to them. If they do, if they don't change at all, if they don't do anything, if they don't go on a quest that challenges them in some major way, there's no real story there. That's more of a sort of, could be an interesting short story, um, but it's not a film. And we have really time for almost no backstory in the action and basically no inner thoughts. Maybe sometimes you get a voiceover, but we have very little time for backstory. So what we see and hear is where the emotion has to come through. And that is a real challenge, but the more you read those screenplays, those ones that recommended and how much emotion can be conveyed within these set parameters. So here is uh, the beginning, the first page of a very mediocre screenplay that I wrote purposely. mediocre -ly. Um And okay, it starts out okay, Sam. Hmm, actually, I would argue that's not okay. It didn't start out okay. Why? Well, I don't know if Sam is male, female, or other. It's really hard to say, and why, and then it says her later. So it's like, oh, Sam was female, then why didn't I just name the person a, a more classic female name? Yes, I'm sure you can quote many different screenplays where a, a female was named Charlie or a guy named Sue or whatever, but why confuse the screen, the, the reader with anything that you don't have to confuse them with? Just be straightforward so we know what someone's like. But then it goes into way too much detail. Straw colored hair, ostentatiously blue corduroy pants. Who, no one cares about this stuff. No one cares. And that Sarah has brown hair with frosted tips and is five, six. It, that none of this matters. 
What matters is what's on the inside. Yes, maybe you have a few external indicators of what someone's like, but almost all the time that doesn't matter. What matters is what's inside someone. What is the conflict raging within them? That's what's gonna be exciting and ironic and fascinating and engaging as we go forward. Um, so then they have just a regular conversation with a misspelling to boot. Hey, how's it going? Oh, hey, Sam, not too bad. Have you seen, okay, I'm already bored, right? So we don't wanna, again, we don't wanna replicate regular life. Regular life, sadly, is not that, the way people talk is not that interesting. Most people's lives are not movie worthy. Um, so already I'm like, oh, these are, these people, I, I wanna start with some sort of conflict. It, again, it doesn't have to be something exploding, but I wanna start, and just already, if you read those previous screenplays, that I just pointed out those first pages, if you read with me, there was already conflict and irony and suspense within just the first words. And already I'm not that interested because they're just, these people are just blabbing about normal stuff. Um, and then uh, it's a sort of a misuse of parentheticals um, in the, where it says he gulps down a sip of his Slurpee. Um, so it shows that this person hasn't really read a lot of screenplays because that's, this is really an action, not a parenthetical. And then if we go to uh, page two of my not very good screenplay, um, we have a very long paragraph, but more to the point, um, it says they're well aware that Shannon has been dropping by every day since his pet labradoodle, uh, a guy named Shannon, that's confusing. Again, there are guys named Shannon but that's not helpful for uh, a, uh, someone who professionally reads screenplays, whose time is limited and who's popping back and forth between emails and assignments and so on. Just don't name a guy Shannon. Um, and how they're well aware that, so now we got into a novel territory. There's some suspicion of foul play, but he was never able to prove it. And my question to you as a reader is, if you were viewing this, how would you possibly know any of this? So this has to all be conveyed through clever and masterful writing through dialogue and action. And maybe this is just backstory. Maybe this isn't particularly important after all. Uh, that's the real bottom line. Most backstory we don't need. Instead, we want to know how backstory affects the character in this moment. We wanna know how it affects them on the worst day of their life. If we go back to that character um, who, uh, let's just say it's a, a woman who is touring the White House and now she has to protect the president for some reason and she's anti-gun. Great. That's all I need to know. I don't need to know a flashback to see why she's anti-gun. I can learn that through her actions now. Maybe she'll explain it at some point to the president. Maybe not. Maybe I just know that she's scared of them, doesn't like them, is against them, has a, a visceral reaction to them. That's probably enough. So this is way too much backstory and it's novel writing, not screenwriting is what I would argue. So this is really fun. There's a lot more errors in this. Maybe you spotted them. Um, and of course, you know, it is an evolving form all the time. So you'll find different levels of all of these in other scripts. But for if this is your first screenplay or you're trying to break in, let's try to avoid at least some of those errors. So as I wrap up, I wanna give you just a few resources um, before we get to uh, Derek, which I'm excited to hear from him and then answer some of your questions. But let's talk about some fellowships. In particular, these are uh, focused on uh, finding diverse new voices uh, within the world. Uh, most of them are US based. Um, there's too many to name here, but um, I'll be giving you my email at the end if you want me to send you this list. A lot of these are from Derek, thank you, Derek. Um, and I put these ones on the right side, uh, the, in particular the, the 10 or so on the right side are ones that my clients and students have won. So I just wanted to uh, separate those and, and shout out to my students. Um, so, but all of these are fantastic programs, but I, I can be pretty sure that they're going to be looking for all of those elements I discussed and then some, a new voice, um, something original, something engaging, something with uh, someone with something to say about this moment that we're living through and all of the professionalism 
that we've been discussing, whether formatting, logline, and everything else. TVcalling.com is a great resource to learn a, bit, a little bit more about how to enter some of these fellowships. And uh, these are a few more resources that I gave last time and I'll give again because they're so important. Number one, you got to read scripts. Here are some, uh, except for tracking board, the other three are free scripts. There are thousands of scripts at these sites. There's no excuse not to be reading them at all times. It's just fun to learn about it. And you have to really understand the craft. Um, there's no basketball player who would go in having never seen basketball. They just played by themselves. No, you have to watch your opponents, but it's not even opponents. It's your, I'm, lear I'm always learning from everyone else out there who's doing great work. And then software, you'll want professional screenwriting software. Luckily, Writer Duet, Writer Solo are free. Highland 2 is free. Paid in is cheap. Final Draft is not cheap, but it's the industry standard. Um, but worthwhile investments, um, all, especially the free ones, um, because if your script isn't professionally formatted, it just won't be, there, there's very little chance anyone's gonna read past the first page, just because it's, they know it's not gonna be worth their time because this person doesn't have the experience within this industry. So to conclude my segment, I want to first say, you gotta write all the time, then rewrite it, rewrite it, rewrite it, put it away, start something new, write that, then go back to your previous project. You, there's, I don't want you to invest years in just one project, nor do I want you to invest just a week and say, well, I finished it, therefore it's worth sending out. It's somewhere in between those, right? It's all about professionalism. Uh, first drafts are great, but then you got to keep going. You should pat yourself on the back, have a drink, and then keep writing or move on to the next project and come back to this one. As I said, I want you to start out with shorts and then expand it to TV pilots and film. That's what I recommend because you can make shorts, you can make web series for no money. You can make video, you can make YouTube videos and just do a scene and see how that works on screen. Then move on to TV pilots and film because writing them is a lot harder and will take all the lessons that you learned in those other projects and expand them. Log lines are vital to create that powerful foundation, understand the irony, the main character, the obstacle they face, and their uh, tangible goal. Outlines are utterly vital as well. Uh, there, you hear occasionally someone writes without an outline. There's no professional writer I have ever known who was able to write without an outline. Sure, you can go back and forth. You could write, then outline, then write, then outline. But you really need, just like you need a strong log line, you need a powerful outline if you're going to move forward in a structured way that delivers on the suspense, humor, and rising stakes throughout every act that we demand from our media that we view. Do join a writer's group, especially a positive, uplifting one, and do get hard feedback. So don't just show it to the people who are gonna say, this is great, uh, this is the first screenplay I've ever read, it seems good to me. I mean, show it to them, that's great, but then show it to people who will give you harder feedback and listen to their feedback if you trust them. When you're ready, enter contests and fellowships. Um, do have something to say. Do make stuff on your own. That's probably the best way to learn is to write something and then you hear actors talk about it. You see the cinematographer look at it and say, well, how, how, do, you, how do you imagine this? And you're like, oh, I don't know. And actors will say, well, why do I say this? And you have to know the answers. So making stuff is the best way to really understand that your scripts are firing on all cylinders. Then I want you to keep expanding your network at all times, um, meeting people, um, don't burn your bridges, only send them a script if they're someone who's high level in the industry when it's really good and preferably not your first script, maybe not even your fifth script, but your 10th or 20th script, right? Um, it's a very, it can be a very discouraging industry, so you gotta just, you got to focus on the craft. You can't focus on, well, why didn't my first one sell? Um, you have to always, you're not trying to sell your first one. Let's put it that way. Just focus on the craft and enjoy it for what it is. It's a learning process. And if you can get to the level where people are asking for your scripts and they say, oh, this is pretty good. What else do you have? Do you have something better? Do you have something in a different genre or do you have something newer? Um, what else do you have? And then you send them a few log lines. Um, that's the level you want to get to. Remember that it's not overnight success. There really is no such thing in this industry, just like you wouldn't expect 
um, someone to invest in your company, if this is the first tech idea you've ever had, you wouldn't expect someone to invest millions of dollars in your film because it's the first idea for a film you ever had. So it's a marathon, not a sprint. And finally, um, it really is, filmmaking is really an all-encompassing industry. You don't have to do it full time, but it really is a lifestyle more than anything else. So it's not just you wrote something and then someone buys it and you make a million dollars and buy a house and live in Laguna Hills. That's not really how it works. You have to enjoy the writing process itself. And if you do, you will find success and engagement and satisfaction in this industry. So I know that there will be many questions in the Q&A and, and Derek and I are eager to answer them. But in the meantime, I know that you will probably want to have uh, questions to ask me. And if you do, please email me anytime. I'm uh, always uh, respond to all, all, all the alums and undergrads who, who email me. It's timothy at blueprintscreenwritinggroup.com. You can follow me on Twitter at, at the real Timothy. And if you're interested in any of my classes or services, you can always go to blueprintscreenwritinggroup.com. That's blueprintscreenwritinggroup.com. Guys, this has been a real pleasure. Let's talk to Derek and then we'll get to your questions. But I hope you got quite a bit out of this in terms of writing your very first screenplay. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Timothy, thank you so much. You, you, you packed a, a whopping amount into that time. Um, that was a really great walkthrough for an entry level, like making your first foray in, into screenwriting. I'm going to be really quick about this because I want to leave a lot of time for the Q&A on the back end. Um, I'm just going to dive a little bit deeper on two points that Timothy made. And then as, as Lisa had suggested, please send in your questions and we'll get to them and we'll roll forward. Timothy and I had talked about it. We're willing to stay a little bit late over the eight o'clock um, if we have some healthy questions out there. Um, one thing that Timothy said that I wanted to go deeper on is this uh, you know, idea Framing your approach to your screenplay, particularly the opening of your screenplay, those first five, 10 pages is extremely important, um, particularly because as Timothy mentioned, you know, there, there, there are a lot of different organizations, production companies, managers, um, those gatekeepers that we were talking about that have rules in place, a three page rule, a five page rule, a 10 page rule. You know, it, it, it's sort of nice when they go as far as 10 pages. And what that means is when they work with their readers, they ended up telling them, hey, if you don't find something that you're liking in the first three, five, 10 pages, throw it out because you have this stack of 20 other scripts right next to you. So keep that frame in mind when you're approaching, particularly a longer piece, that you really, really have to do some special polishing for the introduction, that you're having those elements that Timothy talked about, that we're already getting into irony and questions of antagonism and, and why is this person here and why is their day so bad, as Timothy was talking about but also just the polish of the approach that there's, a, there's almost a checkbox going on in the mind of a reader to say, is this a writer? Is this someone who's done this before? Is this someone who is good enough that they can convince me by page two that they know the format, they know the rules, they can put their voice forward in a way so that by page three, I'm actually on board if they wanna break a couple of rules, if they wanna go into interesting places, but don't do it on page one. Make sure you've convinced us. Make sure you build us towards that. Um, and it, uh, an extension of that thought, and it's a, another really great piece that uh, Timothy was talking about, starting with a short. And there's another reason to start, start with the short, because the short, I, don't, I know a lot of young writers who their short became the intro for their first feature, right? It, 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 it's, a, it's a nice gateway approach. If you get a good, strong 15, 20 page short, which as Timothy mentioned, the upside is it's shootable, it's producible, you can do it yourself. It also really gets you into that entry scope of getting someone convinced that you have the craft and the chops necessary to do something in 10 pages that convinces them to keep reading. A really good short is actually a really good start for a feature. So keep that in mind as well. I think um, the log line is another interesting thing um, that we really want to keep in mind and not just for the sake, and Timothy was right about all the di different pieces, it requires you to answer the right questions. It requires you to move yourself towards who you need to be to be the appropriate writer, which is why it's a good idea to start with a log line, to you know, adjust the log line as you go, and then once you're done, go back and make sure the log line is doing yourself justice. So in process, it's important, but it's also important post. 
because the log line and the ability to put that on paper is not just about the paper. It's about the thought process that requires you to be the right person, to know your material well enough, its strengths, the things you approach it, the, the questions that you answered, to be able to pitch that material in such a succinct fashion. So when you master your log line, it's not just about having, you know, that, that little thing that's going to like be at the uh, edge of an email. It's about being able to be in a room and talk fundamentally about why this is so strong, why I thought this out, and why I can convince you in an elevator pitch or, or you know, just across the table that this is something you haven't seen before. Or, you know, the other side of this is a good log line helps you to become the person who can speak the language of this industry. And that's another thing, and I, I really, you know, double down on what, what Timothy was saying there as well. Um, it's not, you know, everything we talked about today is really mostly um, about the craft, which is you and a computer and final draft and doing your work. But, you know, the process and the confidence that you're giving yourself by doing this the right way, by having the strong outline, by looking into log lines, by making sure the characters are doing what you want them to do, by having strong format, all of those are the confidences that can take you into a room and make you come across better when you're pitching yourself and the strength of you, not just with this one thing you're working on, but the future of you as a writer. So keep all of those things in mind. Um, that's my quick pitch. Um, we've got a couple questions out there. So um, Timothy and Lisa, did we want to uh, jump into the Q and A? Yes, absolutely. Sure, um, let me jump to them. That was fantastic, Timothy and Derek. Wow, um, I've already written my first log line and I'm ready to <laughs> share it with you, Timothy. <laughs> Seriously, um, I had never thought about being a screenwriter, but I, I have an imagination and this actually plays if you have an imagination. So you may, you may see a draft from me uh, down okay. there. But um, I thought it was interesting, a couple of things. One in particular, how you talked about the whole strategy, really when you develop the characters, is to really bring out the character that's raging inside. I actually love that concept. And, and how do you do that? Yeah, great, great question. And not, and not get distracted with all the descriptions of the person in the pink and white dress and the right. You know, so, all, so all the extra words. It's it's interesting because I I think this this gets a little bit into the the some of the angle that Timothy I think eventually would get into with the outlining phase and sort of the development process phase. Um, there is so much pre work that goes into character development. Um, there is so much. Yeah, and, and different writers have different approaches. Some you know, play sort of like games and exercises and what's, what's their favorite song and, and those sorts of you know, things. Those are real and, and, and they're a fundamental part of the process. So you know, you're not necessarily, you're ready to do some drafting and, and, some, and some work towards a process, uh, you know, a project early on, but you might not have even found your character yet, which is why you, you're just constantly drafting for the executed page, but also for the experimental page. And, you know, dropping that character that you think you understand, but what if I throw him into this scene where he's no longer as comfortable as he is in most of the scenes I've written so far? Oh my goodness, that's a voice I hadn't even found before. So a lot of like the truth and honesty in character comes through just a lot of off page, meaning off final product work that you can do, you know, in exploratory fashion. Yeah, couldn't agree more. In fact, I typically start by myself by writing a character bio and or have a write a character monologue just have them say whatever they would say if they could just speak their thoughts um and through those exercises yes we might never see that dialogue we might never see the evidence of that character bio but i bet you we will see at least some of it you have to know your character inside and out and a mistake that a lot of people um for you know especially the first time they're writing make is well i'll just sort of have a character who starts out sort of passive um and they're just sort of drifting through life and then then something interesting happens and to that i say no let's have a character who is filled with conflict already and then a catalyst happens that propels them that forces them into a real journey and the journey of their lifetime. And if you look at your favorite movies, TV shows, the first page of Fleabag, the first page uh, um, of Search Party, you're gonna see exactly that in all of those. There was a character who was already, she's already a human doormat. She doesn't like being a human doormat, but she is. And so what, how can we put that character in the worst possible situation 
for that character to thrive. That's what I want to see. That's going to create drama, comedy, suspense, and more. Fascinating. Um, but I'm going to go into the, our group in a second, but I want to highlight, we have many um, people in the trade. We have uh, on, uh, today in our audience, we have actors, writers, playwrights, film producers, mm -hmm. a digital producer, um, uh, another actor, professor, an artist, an educator, an ex-director of documentary films, Great. a media specialist, um, an investor. I would love if any of you or any of those would be great to kind of hear because you're in the trade with Timothy and Derek. I'd like to share your thoughts or questions. Um, I think that would be particularly interesting to hear from the audience. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Please send, please send in your questions. Um, but one question I saw was. Is it in your question? Yeah. What? Oh, one one thing I saw was. Um, uh, what's the first thing you're to do to start your screenplay? And the first thing I would do is, the first thing I recommend is that you just brainstorm. Uh, that you don't worry about, you know, what, uh, what's the ending? What's the twist? Um, uh, what's a cool action sequence? I mean, those, those are all important elements, sure. But I would just start brainstorming. Um, in fact, I, 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 force my students to start by just brainstorming a list of what are the conflicts that could happen within this scenario that you've set up. So whatever the character is that you've set up, what are some ways they could get into that worst day of their life? Or if you've set up a scenario or a location, what are the worst things that could happen there to that particular character for that particular character's strengths, weaknesses, fears, and wounds? So those are, that's how I would start, is just by brainstorming. We're not saying, oh, just sit down and start writing pages. I, I would rarely say that. I mean, that might work for, that has worked occasionally, but more often it's all about brainstorming, understanding some of the conflicts that could happen, really pushing the situation to its limits and pushing a character to its limits. And to do that, you have to understand the character. And then and, and, another principle that I uh, recommend also is that you, write a first draft that you expect no one will ever see because a lot of the issues that i've encountered um certainly in, in myself and and my clients is that when you write the more screenplays you've read just like you know just like a novel or a great article or a great poem you're like well this first draft is nothing like that ha, ha, uh, i must i must be terrible at this well no that's there's no screenwriter who the first thing out of the gate is perfect. That's not, it's quite the opposite. They are more willing than anyone else to take notes, to listen, to feedback, to rewrite over and over um, until it is perfect, until it encapsulates the irony, the suspense, the character flaws, et cetera. Everything um, that we look for in that particular genre whatever, and format, whatever they may be. So you definitely want to assume that no one is ever going to see this draft. And sometimes people call, call it a vomit draft, which I don't mind that actually. Um, you just vomit it on the page. You just put it out there, just everything you want to say. It's, and just write, I tell people to write the bad version. Stuff that no one would ever say. This, could ne this scene is so dumb or boring. It could never be in the final. Um, it violates all of Timothy's rules. Just... And I say, yes, just write that down. Because having something to edit, having just the raw material to work with is the first step. If you have no raw material to work with, if it's just a, a thought in your mind, there is no project there. That's nothing. No one can, you can't sell a thought in your mind. You can sell something on the page. So we have to start with just the raw material, the vomit draft, and then you'll work up from there. So just assume, just write that first draft, so that no one will ever see it, just you. And then there's no pressure to make it good. It's, ne it's not gonna be Aaron Sorkin level quality and that's okay. In fact, that's expected. Your goal is to not show this to anyone. So that's the first step I would do once you've done those other elements that I mentioned. Uh, Timothy, a question that came to me privately is that when you show the scripts, many of them had very few words, one word, two words, three yeah. words. How do we, who are also trained in English writing classes to write major paragraphs, how do yeah. we change our 
our handwriting, or not handwriting, writing, but the ability uh, to write in very short, pithy, powerful yeah. words. Um, how, do we, how do we make that transition? That's a great question. I mean, I, I'm, I'm curious, I'd love to hear Derek's response, but I say that it, for me, it required unlearning. And for a lot of my clients who've worked in, uh, who are novelists, who've worked in journalism, it requires sort of unlearning that style or taking the, the key informational elements of that style, the key emotional elements, the key character elements, and just and the throwing away the rest. Um, because to write in the highly efficient way where it's one line, two lines, three lines at most sometimes in an entire paragraph, that and to convey an entire world of visual imagery in that short amount of space, that really requires um, lots of familiarity with this format and unlearning a lot of the things we learned when we were writing essays, short stories, and novels. Derek? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, um, you know, for my own story, I started out as a prose writer, um, as a film studies major at Yale. I actually chose that path, the training that was involved, which actually improved my prose writing um, in an interesting way, because I, I think some of what we might feel when we're thinking that there's something in the quality of the prose that, um, you know, uh, is erased, like, in, in, as if we have to do something entirely different. That's not always the case. What we're actually doing is distilling it down to its most visual, straightforward, story-centered elements, which, you know, I mean, you can go back and it, it can work both ways, right? Like the structural and direct approach of storytelling, which is, you know, such a, such a fundamental aspect of screenwriting, can actually make one a better prose writer as well. So it, they're just two different exercises. Um, so, so you don't necessarily think, have to think of them as being a binary, like I, I can do one or I can do the other. You can do both, you're just wearing a different hat or you're, you know, you're using a different pin, like when you're working on one versus the other. Um, I think, you know, that, that distillation process for me, I think is the cleanest take on it where let me strip away the psychology the internalization, all the things that are what make a novel or a short story so rich and so engaging. Those are things I can't lean on when I'm actually trying to manufacture something, which is not a finished product in itself. It's never going to sit on a bookshelf and be, by magnus opus like it is actually just going to be the tool that it's an artistry for sure but it's an artistry towards a tool that allows someone else to finally culminate that visualization so keeping those things in mind uh, makes a writer less dainty about the process makes them not feel like it has to be you know the perfect wording it has to be the most visually focused wording and the clearest descriptor that's going to allow someone else to actually build this for me if you keep those things in mind then um, it's certainly a different process but the same skills, the same ability to communicate, the same way of isolating language down into concept that needs to be rendered, all those things still apply. So a, a good writer can be a good writer with practice in either direction. Absolutely. And, you know, to adapt a novel um, to screenplay, you often hear, and I've had to do this myself, you often hear someone takes the main events that sort of make, that sort of define the novel, the main characters, the main events, maybe a few of the, a few of the lines, the most iconic lines, and then they strip away the rest and they start over. Yeah. And, and that's why, you know, no novel is gonna be the same as a movie. It, they're two different art forms and that's okay. You, you, both are still available to you. Mm -hmm. um, and they just can't be, you can't have that internalization as, as Derek said. Um, you can't have that full description of what the castle looks like. You might just say like the most extraordinary towering castle you've ever seen. Okay, great. That's, that's all we get. That's, that's even that might be too many words. So yeah. that's really all you get and you strip it down and then you build it back up using the language of, of, of screenwriting. The beauty is when you strip it down and take it out of that element, what you end up is maybe the castle becomes a visual signifier that then because you stripped all the covering away becomes an element a more basic almost like fairy tale style element right but a recurring motif or something like that and it actually improves the story because you didn't realize it when it was surrounded with all the beautiful prose so again there's a give and take to the process but um it's, don't be scared away by saying so few words on the page um there's there's a thoughtfulness and a real craft behind why there are so few words and how to distill down in those ways I think there's also something really interesting in the process of um, the conflict that Timothy talked about, finding those conflicts. I think in starting from, you know, before you've even, you know, uh, begun your process, 
you know, when you're, when you're brainstorming and coming up with those conflicts, what you're really also coming up with are potential scenes, right? And, and this keeps you in that mode as an early screenwriter. If you just want to write a scene, if you just want to start with, let me take this character and this other thought that I had and conflict is characterization and conflict is scene. Let me try that and take a stab in that direction and see what comes of it. I know a lot of young writers who have ultimately built some of their early screenplays based on just that a simple concept of what if this character was sitting in this environment and had to deal with this situation. Oh, and, and, and the run actually becomes, you know, manifests more broadly and becomes something more complicated and interesting than if they had probably just sat down and tried to come up with the whole thing before they even started. So sometimes it's just find the conflict and write the conflict and see what happens. Yeah, and that's and that's one of the benefits, as Derek is saying, about of making a short, is you can you don't have to write the whole feature. It's not a whole feature. It is just the core conflict, something that is emblematic of this character's struggle. And if you watch something like Whiplash, or Caroline, or some other um, great you know great short, great memorable shorts you'll see that it's all about one character in one situation. It's the worst day of their life. Um, they are ill-suited for the task at hand. What is the conflict? How do they get out of that? And that provides the core conflict that the entire film is centered around. And that's how it gets funding is people start to see that short and they say, oh my God, if that's the core, what, you know, what else? If that happens to the character, what else happens to them? And I got to see them in their worst day of all time and that exposed who the character is. And that's one reason I kept repeating, you know, worst day of her life, worst day of her life, worst day of his life, is because that exposes character. It's someone in conflict, someone with a goal, they have a major obstacle, that is the conflict. How do they push through to reach their goal? That is character. Almost 8.15, any other questions? We could probably take another question. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I just wrote a note. Um, Derek, can you, um, uh -oh. can you highlight, sorry, I'm on mute. Um, can you highlight briefly, because we have, I should say, um, of 135 people who've been on this, um, this workshop, 75% are from Yale College. Oh, and 7% um, are current students, 15% are the last three years. Um, and the other folks on it represent everybody from School of Management, PhDs, forestry, medicine. We have a number of doctors on, on here as well. And we range um, from, in terms of um, the, gra the school, the, the years from 1974 to, to, to 2024. So in right. terms of the representation of the audience, I wanna <laughs> thank you guys. Yeah, that's for great. Signing up um, and being part of this, but I was thinking, that Derek, given your role at OCS, if you could if you could highlight just a few things, how um, I just put in your um, your email address for them to contact you, but while we're still sheltering in place for a while, um, you're available. And just a few words. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I'm the associate director for the arts in the office of career strategy, so I work with the undergrads specifically. I also um, have a, a appointments with the alums for Yale College, um, unfortunately not the professional schools. Um, but there's a ton of resources available for everyone, whether you're Yale College or not. Um, uh, if you check out our website, ocs.yale.edu, um, go to backslash CGCC, that's Common Good and Creative Careers. And then you can check out you know, the arts um, and the communications areas, which entertainment lives in there. Um, there's a, a whole ton of resources in there that uh, a great way to introduce and see some of the resources that Timothy is talking about and some additional resources um, more broadly within the industry, not just within screenwriting. Um, I do uh, take on uh, appointments. I do want to mention um, I'm uh, going to be off uh, for the summer for in a couple of weeks. So um, we might, you know, if you'd like to pick up um, with an advising session, you, we might need to grab that towards the end of the summer when I return. But other than, you know, when I'm off in the summer, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I am always uh, looking forward to engaging with our, our alums as well as our undergrads. So, yeah. That's great. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one or two. Any questions from anybody? Everybody's sort of quiet today. Um, which is, yeah. Oh yeah, you mentioned cross campus. You threw it in there. We, I should say that out loud. 
Um, yeah. Another really great way, uh, uh, Timothy talked about networking and that's so fundamental to so many of these things, including things like finding your, your, your writers and group, right? Finding other alums who are in the same vein and thinking about the same things. They don't need to be writing the same kind of material. Right. They can be a playwright. They can be a novelist. They can, you know, the, the, your audience and the quality of read is not necessarily doesn't need. They don't need to be a great screenwriter. They need to be a great reader. Um, and you can provide for them like feedback in, in other genres as well. So finding the people who are creative and engaged and want to be part of this um, same process. It's so you know rare and difficult to find a quality um, writers group. Um, and so you know, do what you can using things like cross campus and you know other other um, uh, alumni specific resources to build that community of practice that every writer needs. Right, and just you know, last thing I would like to add, you know, these these have all been great resources, Lisa and Derek, is that um, yeah, you I really recommend a writing group, especially one that is supportive and. One, one benefit of that is not just to test your final script, but to test the idea from the base as it grows, as it grows, as it grows. Um, you want to test it at each and every stage um, to see if the outline is working, and then is the treatment working, and then is the are individual scenes working, and then is the act working. So um, sort of a an error, I guess I would say, an issue that I see over and over is someone comes you know, to, to a script consultant like me um, or to a writing group that I'm in or that I run and the first, and, and they have the whole script. And well, if they've been testing it at each phase, if they've been testing the, you know, trying out different log lines and then different outlines and then different, you know, just summaries of different scenes, then I might truly have been able to advise it at each level so that we could do that expansion that I was talking about in terms of really pushing the character to their limits and the situation, the irony, the conflict to their limits. So it really helps to, to be testing it, or it doesn't even need to be a writing group. It could just be with one person at a time. Um, that's, uh, that's okay too. But you really, um, you know, but again, for your first ideas, again, it's more than okay to just get that idea on that page, okay. uh, just oh, that vomit Timothy, draft. Timothy, thank you. We have a raised hand, Ellen. Yeah, um, I'm trying should, to find you. Yeah, they should really type it in the chat. Yeah. I think it's better. Ellen, can you type your, because I can't find you on the screen, can you type your question or comment in the chat? Um, and while they do that, one more thing I'll mention is that um, what we're really looking for, I, I think some people might be having trouble with the chat, maybe, Maybe, uh, yes, I see a lot of nods that people cannot, the chat isn't working. So oh. maybe that's, that's a problem. Oh my God, okay. So that, that could be it. Um, maybe, maybe as you figure that out. Um, one thing I'll mention is that uh, I always remember the screenplays that made me feel something, whether that's delight, horror, laughter, um, you know, whatever tension, whatever it might be uh, that movie, like Arrival, if you read that first draft of Arrival and you don't feel something, I would, it's, I would say you might not be human because it is so passionate. It's such, a, it's such a journey. You feel like you care deeply about these characters. And so, and there are a few, a handful of other scripts that I remember uh, because of the emotion that I felt from them. So that is really the, an essential, essential component that it takes time to master, but once you do, if, if people remember what they felt after they read your script, just like any work of art, just like theater, po poetry, uh, film, whatever it is, um, if, um, if you can make someone feel something and remember what they were feeling at the end, then you've, they'll pass it up the chain. People who, the gatekeepers will pass it up the chain. Um, and the last thing I wanted to add was, um, and, and we've said it before, but I think it's worth you know, underlining a few times, huh. um, reading. Um, you know, don't skip that step. Uh, it's easy to, to be passionate about what you want to tell in the story and, and your voice, but you will improve every step along the way by reading as much and as widely as possible. Um, Timothy put out some of those free resources that are out there. Um, you need to have read all the classics. You need to have read you know, the contemporary things. You need to see the films and understand what you love and then go read the script because they're different. 
and understanding what it took to build the foundation that that film was 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 made from it's actually those are two entirely different modes and understanding the framework is what will make you a better writer more so than just watching you know, the finished product hi this is i'm back on something happened to my um my app mac i just fixed the chat command so that the chat feature should be working if someone could send a chat to everyone um ellen has her hand raised ellen we, we could try calling we could try calling on ellen just okay, for fun ellen, should i unmute I'll, un I'll unmute ellen oh there she is hi how ellen, are you, are you on? i'm hi, so sorry about that I still don't see a chat window, but uh, my question is, uh, um, while you're bouncing your scripts off of different people and, and, and um, asking for feedback on ideas, how do you, how do you uh, protect your intellectual property? So you, you don't really worry too much about that, um, is, is, the, is the quick and easy answer. Um, it, it, it is, I hear that a lot and I understand it and it feels like you put such time and effort into this thing and there's so much ownership and at stake involved in this. But the truth is the, the way that the industry works, um, you have to share broadly in order to get feedback and you can't work. You, there are things, right? You can trademark, you can go into the guild and you know, you know, send copies in and, and do that, that part of it. But you know, there's just a lot of churn in terms of material. And if you're too precious about the things that you've been building, you're actually gonna miss some opportunities to hand it off to someone in a meeting or have the manager who's willing to take it on and read it, like that's a good thing. Um, and you shouldn't you know, put a barrier, an, an extra barrier between yourself and the gatekeepers to, to worry overly um, about the possibility that someone's gonna read a script and take your original idea. That, it's a thing, it does happen. Um, and, and again, there are protections, you, know, you can uh, uh, register things with the guild and, and, and there are protections in place. But if, if you feel like that's been getting in your way in terms of a willingness to share your material, um, be a little cautious with that because that can sometimes be creating a barrier that's not necessary. Thank you. Couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, yes, the, the, real, the real answer is, I, as I said, sort of ideas, you know, what's in your head might be a great idea, but there's no way to know until it's on the page. This industry is all about execution, um, not just, um, the idea, I mean, the idea is essential, um, but there are very few brand, brand new ideas. But to have your individual voice, your experiences, um, your past, your education, uh, what you have to say about the topic, and to put that on the page, that's what people are really paying for. So it's all about execution. So no one's way I put the way I put this is. If so, if a if um, if Viacom wants to steal my idea, they're going to successfully steal my idea. But ideally, my idea is going to be so well executed, um, so unique, such a unique vision that uh, no one is going to want to that Viacom isn't going to want to steal it. They're going to want to pass it up the chain. They're going to want to make it. And as Derek said, you have to be willing to share. And because that's how this industry works is that people pass it onward and upward. It's not like a patent or something like that. There's no totally unique idea. And uh, you just can't be scared of that is, is the bottom line. And you can't get feedback if um, you are not passing it around to some extent. That doesn't mean pass it around to everyone in the world but to trusted people and then to agents, managers, producers, directors, and so and, on. And those first gatekeepers, that, that first level of engagement tends to be the manager or the agent. And those people, you know, they're gonna to wanna to read your material, not just for that one particular um, uh, piece, right? They, they, they wanna see the writer. And, 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 and they're not really as interested in stealing an idea and moving along with it without you. They wanna see whether or not you have the goods in terms of the, your, yeah. your voice. Yeah, you're selling yourself, absolutely. Um, should we should we call on uh, call on the other people who've raised their hand? Do we have time? And I just want to say I did I checked the chat feature and it's open and running. So yeah, uh, maybe, I don't know. It, it may be a Zoom issue. I'm sorry. No, yeah. people Let's, are uh, shaking their heads. Well, sorry about that. So just raise your hand. Timothy, you want to call on them? Or you want me to call on them? Deb uh, has your hand raised. Deb. Hi. 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 I am uh, three everybody. quick questions. Okay. I have three quick questions that are technical. Uh, the first is music. 
Is it okay to, inc to include it in the script? And oh, second is slug lines. Um, is it okay to use continuous or same? And third is what do you think of flashbacks? These are some of my most frequently thank asked you. questions. So I'm glad, thank you. Uh, so I'm glad oh, you sorry. asked them. Um, music, music, I don't recommend it in general because um, it's better to just say the type of music usually because it assumes there's there's a low chance that it come, unless you're writing for a Marvel movie right. type of budget that, that they'll be able to get that music and it might show that you don't fully understand the industry. I mean, yes, occasionally you do see music examples, but it's it's rarely helpful actually because if I see a p if I see a song and I don't know it now I feel like I'm left out of a so I'm I'm already like getting off that train and you want me on the train you want me chugging forward right so you want me to feel like I'm included in this conversation um, yeah. so I don't I I would say unless the song is intrinsic to a, a device or aspect of your plot or characterization um, avoid using a specific reference to a song. And then in slug lines, yes, continued, same, totally great. Either one, both. Flashbacks, look, um, yeah, we can all name some great films that use great flashbacks or TV shows or how to get away with, how to get away with murder is like half flashbacks and that's, that works for that show. But in general, what I see is that they are overused. And by overused, I mean they're not necessary. They provide backstory that we really, um, that decreases tension actually because I didn't need to know that. I wanted that person to remain a mystery. Another issue is that it actually slows down the film um, because as I said, it's a t we want a time delineated goal with an obstacle. And if I'm jumping either forward in time or backward in time, it, c it slows down my progress. So I feel less of that tension. It's like if, you, if you're on a race and then if, if you're, you know, see, see cars racing around a track and then they're allowed to stop for, for an hour or so and just have a, like a snack break. It's, that's a boring race, right? We want them to have to race all in one and get to that finish line and the ones who don't um, will be discarded or something like that's like a Mad Max situation. But like we, we want that tension in the room at all times. So flashbacks are, tend to be overused and I would use them sparingly. What, one good way to approach that, sort of a litmus to give yourself, would be, w can you execute this without the flashback? Yep. That, that's either without the flashback at all, or just linearly, you know, maybe you didn't start the story early enough. Maybe you did need that scene, and it shouldn't have been a flashback. It should have been the first scene in the film. Um, and if the answer is, is yes, um, then don't use the flashback. It has to be, if it's, it, they almost have to be required. I mean, if you think of like a memento or something like that, where the chronology is broken for very, very specific reasons, and it wouldn't be the same story without the flashback, that makes sense. Um, if it's, if, but nine times out of 10, 99 t times out of 100, the story is actually clearer, cleaner, stronger, more, you know, um, uh, emotionally focused, like if you're not breaking it through the flashback. I couldn't agree more. Same goes for voiceover. It tends to be overused. They're saying what that what we already assumed was in their head. Now, if they're saying something totally different, um, like you know, like in Fleabag, now mm -hmm. that can provide some level of irony that that adds to the story. But um, mostly, voiceover tends to be overused, um, as does as do flashbacks. So yes, I would I would totally agree with Derek. If they're intrinsic to the structure or vital for the humor or whatnot, then great. Otherwise, let's just go forward in a straightforward manner and see if you can execute that. that that's hard enough in itself. So right. you don't need to add tricks to the structure or anything like that. Um, should we uh, should we call on the, on one more person before, yeah. We, yeah. before um, we wrap yeah. up? I don't know what's going on with the chat thing. So yeah, someone yeah. else wanted to raise their hand? Yeah, someone did. Speaking? Oh, hi, how are you? Hi, um, how are you? Hi. <laughs> Um, so my question is, um, if you're just starting out and you're trying to be a um, TV writer, what, and you're trying to build up a body of work, how long should it take you to write one script? I, I heard on a writing podcast that you should aim to write like one new completed spec script every month. I don't know if that's, uh, yeah, is that a lot? I don't know. <laughs> that seems like they would that, be That's a lot, but, but um, I'm, I would approach this in a slightly different way because yes. it's, 
But what I like about that advice is the idea that, that don't think of it as a goal, like a, a completed portfolio and then you're done, right? So, so what I like about that, you know, a new episode a month or whatever it is, I mean, they're pretty aggressive, but, but the idea is that you're, you as a writer, particularly if you're going to write serials and, you know, t- and TV, you're just constantly writing new material. And so you get done with one, maybe it's not done yet, and you put it on the shelf because it's, you're hung up on something and you start the next one and you start the next one and you start the next one. And the, the rationale for that is that you need like new material, you need new thoughts, you need to be trending with what's going on within the industry and what the new voices are saying and we want to be one of those new voices. So I, I do like the aspect of just constantly writing without a goal of now I'm finished, I'm complete, I'm crossed the line. Um, which is even more so on the TV writing side. The feature is the same, right? You're never done. It's just the next feature. But, to, but for TV, just having that engine of constantly producing, I think, I think that's a healthy way of looking at it. Now, whether that's a, you know, one a month seems a little aggressive, um, but if that's your goal and you fall short of the goal, so what? Yeah, that's, that's uh, look, in, often you'll have to get a draft. In a, in a writer's room, you have to get a draft in two weeks, maybe you're not in a writer's room yet in, you are honing your craft and that's that goes back to what i said about enjoying the process it's a marathon not a sprint so i would rather you spend eight months ten months let's say I, not exclusively doing that but for, you know focusing on a script uh, and get that really good so that if you send that to someone then they say hey this is awesome um what else do you have rather than you're like, well, I turned this out really fast. And they're like, great, but it's not that good. So what, what can I do with it? There's no that, time that, stamp. You can't put a time stamp yeah. on it. Yeah, you don't, you, it's, not, it's not a race in that sense. It's, it's a distance thing. So don't worry about the speed, but always, now I'm glad you brought this up because you should always be writing down your future ideas. You know, write down tons of ideas. Um, you might end up using none of them or, or one of them or pieces of them, who knows. But the, if you're always writing down ideas for new TV, I think I wrote down three new ideas for TV series um, this week already. And I'm gonna end up using probably none of them, but it's like, what, at least be, who knows? So be writing them down and be thinking about and starting to develop from the log line to the outline to the treatment, um, start developing them right off uh, at, at all times so that you can be honing that first script, you know, working on the, ba- you know, the vomit draft of the second script and thinking about what your third script is gonna be. That's what's most important as, as exactly as Derek said. Thanks. Great, okay. great question. Thanks everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for everybody speaking up. Any more, one last question from the audience before we wrap up. This is your chance. Um, the hand goes up, we've got an over here iPad 9, can you just say your first name and your Yale affiliation? I guess. Okay, sorry about that. My name is, oops, I'm not allowed, I can't unmute. No, we can hear you. Oh, you can't? I'm so sorry. My name is Helen, um, and I'm sorry, I couldn't change the um, name on the participants like I wanted to. Um, I don't know why, but um, my question is, and I might have misunderstood you. Um, when you were talking about dialogue in the, um, when you first have dialogue on the first page, you were saying it needed to be, like it obviously couldn't be dull. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to make dialogue realistic, like, you know, everyday type of dialogue. Oh, I'm sorry, everyday type of dialogue. Yeah. So it doesn't sound, you know, unrealistic and stilted or, or unbelievable, but at the same time, true, I still wanna, I'm taking your advice, I would like to capture the interest. So how do you balance that? The capturing the interest, but still yeah. being, this is relatable yeah. dialogue. It's not something completely weird. Yeah, that, that, that's a really, I, I'm glad you pointed that one out because it, it, it's tough, right? From the perspective of an authentic, almost like a documentary style of writing where you want to like put in the, 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 the figure of speech in a way and the, and the stuttering and those sorts of things. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's noticeable that in some good movies, that, that's actually what makes it to the screen. But a decent amount of that is coming into the performance and the decisions being made by the actor and the authenticity being added on, on top. Uh, I, th- I, th- I think I'll let Timothy speak to this directly, but I think what Timothy was talking about was the idea of being very cautious, um, particularly in those first few pages that, that, that you come across as having like a, 
a clean sense of voice and a clarity in, in the kinds of decisions being made and, 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 and an efficiency in, in the approach and getting too, you know, colloquial, getting too, you know, in the process of, of the ums and the ahs and those sorts of things. Most likely with that five page, three page, five page, 10 page rule, it will feel distracting. It will feel inauthentic, even if it is more authentic to the ear um, once it makes it on the screen. Um, but you know, just you have to balance that out to, to help us to understand, you know, the character well, well enough that you would be giving that to the actor who then would make some, you know, insert the ums and the ahs and those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, what Derek said, I, I, you know, something that helps me too is turning on the, you know, the English subtitles to English speaking films and you start to see, oh, these are really compact, efficient ways of speaking much more than if you were to transcribe just a regular conversation. Regu again, regular conversations are looping, repetitive, they don't make sense, stuttering, all of that, and th because that's what we're used to. But if we were to see that on film, it would be more like a documentary where they forgot to cut out the boring parts. So just keep in mind that just like our regular lives are not structured like a movie, regular dialogue is not structured um, like, or, or great dialogue is not structured like the way we actually speak. At the same time, my top tip is to say it out loud, is to really have a conversation with yourself. There are some screenwriting programs that even have a feature where you can assign different voices to the script and it will read it out loud for you. And that can be, I always try to say it out loud to myself and just say, does this, does this feel natural? Um, does this feel like what this character would say? And uh, just one more tip just to close out is, do your characters all talk like you or do they each talk in their own voice? And that takes a long time to work on, don't get me wrong. But if you can cover up the names of all of your characters before they speak and still know who is speaking, then you really have given those characters a unique voice within your script. So those are some of the tools and tricks I recommend to make sure your characters sound realistic and distinct from one another. Helen, did you have a follow-up question? There's Helen. I think, I think she, right. I think everyone's an expert. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Nicole? Nicole has her hand up. Um, I know this is a, 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 a seminar on craft, but I'm going to ask something about the business that perhaps I'll bring back to craft. Um, given the range of people we have on here and the walks of life and the different ages and whatnot, um, would you confidently say that as long as you get the craft right, you have a fighting shot? And the reason I'm asking this is, you know, I'm a middle-aged woman. Um, you know, I'm yeah. sure that whatever, there's all sorts of isms, there's all sorts of, and I'm, and you know, and I'm not the hot shot and I'm not necessarily the profile and I don't know anyone in the business and whatnot. Can we take away from this that if you get the craft right, you got a fighting shot? Oh, absolutely. Um, the, I, I mean, there's a reason scripts don't come with, you know, resumes and bios and, and, and headshots, right? Um, the, the, it's a, you're, you're going to be one on a stack of, you know, 30 or so on someone's desk. Um, and no one knows anything about you. And there's definitely, whether you've included a cover letter or not, no one's going to read it. And um, they're going to pick it up and they're going to go straight for those first 10 pages. And if you sell them, then they love your voice. And they, they end up finishing the script, which is always the indicator. And then they send it up to whoever's going to be next in the, in, in the gatekeeping process. Um, and none of that has anything to do with who you are. It has to do with what, what made it onto the page. Keep that in mind. That's a, that's a, you don't have to worry about any of those things. You can just put it into the page because it's one of the true, you know, one of the, the, the rarities of the industry that there's a certain amount of, you know, um, if it's strong on the page, then that's how you're going to make your way into this industry. Um, it's, an, it's an end all. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like to think of it as, as a lot more than acting or, or most other parts of the industry. It's, um, it's very meritocratic. Um, it is really all about, do you have something unique to say? And it doesn't matter if you're from Oklahoma or 
or LA or New York. Like it, it doesn't, that's not what's, what people are looking at. They're saying, do you have something new to say in a fresh way, in a professional way, in a compelling way that left me feeling something at the end of the day? And if you can do all those things, then your script, you know, with, with just even a basics of a network, which you probably already have based on the people you went to school with and the people you've met over the, over your life and the old friends who went into the, that business, um, you probably already have that. So with that basic network, you can probably, you probably have what it takes. What people don't typically have, and that's why I wanted to focus on craft here, is those skills. They haven't worked on the script enough where it passes that test that Derek said of like, am I interested in the first page? Am I interested in the first five pages? Am I, uh, oh man, and the, there's almost no time where I've read a, a script that actually ended up selling, that actually ended up uh, making it to a series or getting bought as a pilot where I didn't, I couldn't see that within the first few pages. Almost immediately, mm. I'm like, this is a professional. They have something to say. I've never seen quite this take. There's something new about it. Um, I instantly can see why it's sold. And conversely, I can instantly see why uh, that I'm that I'm not in the, that I'm not in what I call not in good hands. That I'm in a right. someone who doesn't have that much experience, and they this is their first script out of the gate, and that's great. Don't get me wrong. I, I mean that's awesome. Um, I work with many first-time screenwriters, but you can t you can tell someone's tenth script from their first script, and their you know twentieth script from their tenth script. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we've come to the end. Is there one, I hate to land this because we've got 68 people still here, but is there one final, final question from someone in the audience before we say goodbye? I guess not. Um, Derek, do you, do you have any closing remarks and then Timothy and then I'll wrap up? Yeah. Uh, I'm, um, I was glad to participate in another one of these. T Timothy, it was, uh, it's just been a, a great back and forth. I really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, uh, looking forward, uh, Lisa, to hearing more about um, the program that um, you're, you're going to be doing on uh, diversity within the industry. Um, I think that's, uh, a, you know, a time well spent in, in that direction as well. So um, I look forward to hearing more about that. Great. Thank yeah. you. We hope you're yeah. involved too. And uh, yeah, people are always looking for new voices. Um, someone with something to say about the state of our world. And that doesn't mean it has to be, you know, drama. It doesn't have to be, there's no one thing it has to be. Um, but if you can say something with humor, with empathy, um, caring about these characters, compelling page that we can't stop reading, uh, conflict-filled situations, people um, in the worst day of their lives, uh, you will break through. That's great. Well, I want to thank I want to thank Timothy Cooper and Derek Webster for your time and your us. So I'll give them a round of applause. I think I can do one of these clap things. <laughs> great. Thanks so much. Claps, you guys are great. Um, again, I don't want to have a chat, but thank you for having forty five minutes of online dialogue. I mean, I think that actually in this time where we're still sheltering in place to have a dialogue, I think it actually worked out well in a way. I think it was a positive mishap if you can have yeah. it maybe that's one of your ironic twists there you go and you can this that's into a script how <laughs> i'm just saying um and i will i really want to thank also all the participants we you know the 135 of us on here you're from across the country i think we're in like 30 states we're also singapore is on here um right. Ireland is on here. So we've got people from around the country. And again, Yaley's, um, thank you for being part of this. Stay tuned. It'll probably take a couple of weeks for us to, for Timothy, our master of ceremonies and our master screenwriter, who is creating our next um, program on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the screenwriting profession. Um, so stay tuned for that. But a little bit of advertising, if you're a 20s grad, and if you are a first gen alum, please join us tomorrow. We have a welcome party for all the 20s grads from across Yale, all the schools, uh, Yale College and the GMP schools. And we want all alumni to come and welcome them. It's more of an informal gathering, but a little bit of advertising. Um, uh, Suzanne Solinsky, class of 83, is running that event. And again, as Derek said, join Cross Campus. Cross Campus is a wonderful new program, a uh, joint venture from the Alumni Association, the Office of Career Strategy, and some others to basically connect alumni and students 
So you guys can go on register and they have like link, like a mini LinkedIn. You can find profiles of others in the screenwriting profession and the writing profession or any other areas you're interested in. You can connect, you send messages, people respond, you meet offline. It's actually a wonderful tool. It's a Yale only tool. There's nobody out, outside in here. So it's definitely a closed, closed group. Um, now there are about 8,000 alumni and students on there. It, it launched about two months ago, so stay tuned for that. For you guys who are on Facebook, there's a Yale Authors Group, um, which this is part of. Uh, there are around 300 alumni in that now. Again, that's alumni only. It's also a closed group, but it's Facebook, so you've got Facebook, gotta make sure. But there are alumni on there who are authors and writers, all different kinds of writers. So you guys in the audience who are writers or screenwriters, others, um, feel free to join that network as well that I think would be helpful. And just again, thank you, Timothy, and thank you, Derek, and thank you everyone here. And um, we'll see you in a couple of weeks, if not tomorrow at our welcome party. But thank you very much. Pleasure, thank, thank you. Everybody be safe. Be safe. Be safe, thank you for staying on longer than expected. It was a great, great workshop. And thank My you. Pleasure. Good night. Thank you.